I'm Sam Lee. This is Open Country, and I'm here in Stonehenge. There came three men out of the west, their fortunes for to try. And they have sworn a solemn oath, John Barleycorn should die. It's such a powerful thing, getting this close, walking up this path towards one of the most important places in the whole world. And the sarsen stones, the way they've weathered this sandstone, they have taken on such a sort of abstract sculptural, like they've been shaped by thousands of years of wind. They're just so elegant. Everyone says how small it is. I don't agree at all. I think it's enormous. <laughs> I'm Sam Lee. I'm a folk singer and song collector, and I'm here in the incredible World Heritage Site of Stonehenge on the Salisbury Plain. This site is still closed at the moment, and while it's closed, I wanted to find ways of connecting people to sites like Stonehenge with song. And in this open country, we're about to hear some of those songs. The first is John Barleycorn. Good wine, wine in a bottle and cider in a can. John Barleycorn in a brown bowl will prove the strong. It was appropriate just to ask permission before entering in to such a sacred place. This is the first church in some ways, one of the first places in, in these islands that we've come to, to celebrate the gift of nature. Just a sense of the people who this connects us to, the Neolithic, those people who, who are buried in these lands in the barrows here. Why here? <laughs> Why did they come here? The powerful thing about folk song is that they're songs that come from the land. It's through the people, but they come from the land. So to be in a place like this, that's such a symbol of that relationship, it's kind of like the greatest concert hall one could ever ask for as a folk singer, to come and bring our indigenous native songs that go back for thousands of years. It's a phenomenal experience. It brings a whole new meaning and raison d'etre to what a folk song is and why, why we have to sing them. The project Songs of England is all about working with other people to think about connections and, and drawing together different ideas, different narratives, different stories, all of which relate in some way to the landscapes and the, the historical monuments within England. Matt Thompson is from English Heritage and is the man behind the project who invited the Nest Collective to come and collaborate in telling the stories of some of the sites in new and unusual ways. Here we are virtually underneath the Iron Bridge in Shropshire. We're in the Iron Bridge Gorge, also known as the Severn Gorge. The River Severn comes through here. This was absolutely the super highway of its day with goods and, and materials coming up and down the river. It's very, very early spring. The trees aren't quite out in leaf just yet. But it really feels kind of bucolic, you know, we're surrounded by a countryside. But when this bridge was built in the latter part of the 18th century, this was the heart of the Industrial Revolution. There were lead smelters, iron foundries, there were sort of businesses, industries everywhere. The air was polluted, the river was polluted. One poet wrote about it in terms of, oh, violated Colebrook. Colebrook being the name for this area before the iron bridge was built and characterised it as a battle between the Cyclops, the assistant to Vulcan at the forge, between Cyclops and then all the naiads and dryads and natural spirits. It was a fight between the two. I think it's really important that people look at the landscape around them, look at the things that are in the landscape, the ruined castles, the monasteries, the ruins, or indeed these fantastic remains of our industrial past. And we think about them as embodying lots of different people, people's hard work, people's thoughts, their hopes, their ambitions, their dreams, all of them, people just like us. It's quite difficult sometimes, just working from the history books, to really make a connection with people in the past. 
And I think that song and music can be a really powerful way of engaging emotion. So actually, song is a beautiful way to kind of bring these to life. You know, the past, in some ways, can be quite silent on, on people's experiences. But song really gives a voice to people that it can sometimes be quite hard to hear. You know, we're a charity. We look after about 400 places up and down England. These were places that people couldn't get to. These places are remarkable. and They tell a story of overcoming suffering. They tell a story of victory and defeat. They tell a story of human perseverance. There's everything here. And similarly, you know, the songs do the same job. Well, I'm standing right now in the very centre of Stonehenge with a, a murmuration of starlings flying amongst these mighty sarsen stones, the big outer ring with their lintels laying on top of many of them, and also surrounding us, slightly smaller, are the, are the blue stones, the famous blue stones, many of them brought over from Wales. Like many of the songs of this country, the monument we think of as English is in fact a product of the many distinct cultures of the British Isles. In Northumberland, the brothers Gillespie live in the village of Wall, very close to Hadrian's Wall. Song connects Sam and James to a border's culture, which is neither English nor Scottish, but something quite of its own. Ah, come fill the car, let's drink a boot. For this night we hear merry Sam and James Gillespie are singing When Fortune Turns the Wheel, a song from the Northumbrian borders that encapsulates that bittersweet feeling of parting from friends and hoping to meet again, something we all feel very strongly right now. For to see you all again, kind friends, a secret joy of peace. So we are the Brothers Gillespie, I'm Sam. And I'm James. And we grew up in a village called Wall, which, as its name might suggest, is very, very close to Hadrian's Wall. If you were standing on Wall Village Green, you would look up and you would see the fell, Wall Fell. There are some stone steps, some old stone steps, and it's quite a forested hill. So if you're looking at it in, in spring or in summer, it's really bursting with life. If you're sort of paying attention, you can almost hear it sort of calling to you, you know. So sort of come out, come outside, you know, leave the house, come up onto the heights. And then if you turn your gaze to the north, you'll see buzzards circling on a clear day and you can see very, very far over the line that used to be marked by the Roman wall and now is still marked by the tumbled lines of stones. You can see north into the, the wild and unclaimed lands what in later times became known as the, the borders and uh, were known for their lawlessness and the loyalty of the people who lived there to their family. For the Gillespie brothers, this border landscape with the Roman wall at its heart has a huge influence on their sound and the sound of the traditional songs they love. I think something got kind of dropped in, you know, like a pebble into a, a pool by the stillness of the place. Mm. Hearing the Northumbrian pipes, I remember that as a child, hearing the just that totally unique kind of sound, the kind of hollow skirl mm -hmm. of the pipes. And it's so different to any other pipes. Because there really is a strong feeling of resonance in quite a mysterious way between the Northumbrian traditional music and, and the sound of the pipes and the landscape. You almost feel like you're following a thread. Our parents listened to an awful lot of music. And some of the, the stuff they had in their vinyl collection would be the High Level Ranters, say, which is an mm. you know, amazing Tyneside band. And it's actually where we heard, first heard the song, Fortune Turns the Wheel. For I must strain no far away when fortune turns the wheel. It fills me with a feeling of, of sort of deep, kind of hearty sort of sustenance and fortitude to, to listen to them singing that song. A sense of the land, of, of the borders and of Northumberland. 
there's different versions of the song on, on both sides of the border that have been collected at different times. So the version that we sing mentions Coquetdale, which is a valley in Northumberland. Oh, you do, yes, of Caledon, likewise we Other versions mention Liddersdale, which is a valley on the north side of the border. So you get a sense of this song being sung by shepherds and travelling people on both sides. You can imagine people parting from one another, perhaps because of the arbitrariness of the border itself mm -hmm. and how it, how it divided people's lives, not just in Roman times when there was a literal dividing wall which was controlling the flow of people, but also in later times when you have where historically for hundreds of years neither crown really controlled the terrain mm. and the people just relied on their own solidarity and uh, fierceness and loyalty to each other to survive. Yeah. That, that's yeah. the most um, exciting thing about about singing the old songs. Yeah, think, is, it is. Yeah. Is that feeling of like a torrent from the past yeah. sort of coming through Moving your through heart you. and then, you know, with your mouth <laughs> yeah, to yeah, yeah. sing it. We went on a, a, a sort of long distance walk of a few days and sort of sang the song there. It was a really powerful feeling, wasn't it? Mm. You know, it's a real song of camaraderie, the warmth of, of true friendship and that being a kind of really fundamental sustaining force in life. You know, what we're longing for is connection. It's been one of the great pains of this time is to not be able to fully draw that sustenance that we normally draw from from friends and from friendship yeah that's a painful thing but it is so wonderful to look forward to the times when we can really gather again you know and, and, and not worry about how close we're being and and, yeah. and sort of drink celebrate from the same cup yeah, again, drink from it? the same <laughs> cup drink from the quake you know the cup of friendship that's what the song is all about You're listening to Open Country with me, Sam Lee. And we've travelled through time and geography from here in Stonehenge in the southwest up to the border country of Hadrian's Wall where the Reavers lived in Northumberland. One way or another, the songs connect into not just the sites but also uh, the towns or land around. For instance, if we go a little bit further south into Yorkshire, we'll hear Faye Heald singing The Whitby Lad in homage to that seaside town and the great Gothic ruins of Whitby Abbey. Come all ye bold and rambling boys and a warning take by me For I'd have you quit night walking and shun bad company For in sun or sun what have you done you bound for botany bay I was born and bred in Whitby town and raised most honestly the Whitby Lad is about a young man from Whitby who's got in with a bad crowd and done a crime and he's being transported to Australia to go and live in the colonies. So it's a song from his perspective saying farewell to this land and people that he knows as he's going off into this very unknown world. It's kind of a warning song for others against crime. This guy is leaving Whitby Harbour so he'll be standing on his boat there'll be bells clanging in the background seagulls squawking and he'll be going out through the harbour at Whitby with the hills on each side clay roofed houses in a little hamlet in a very fishing area of the town and the abbey of course sitting up on the top looking down on it all Whitby Abbey was a 7th century Christian monastery that later became a Benedictine abbey the Abbey Church was situated overlooking the North Sea on the East Cliff above Whitby, and the ruins of the Abbey have continued to be used by sailors as a landmark at the headland. In the song The Whitby Lad, 
Faye imagines the young convict boy sailing into the unknown, taking his last sight of the Abbey and his home. I think because it's in the first person, you're singing as this guy is being sent off. This is what he's thinking. And because it's written like that, you're immediately drawn right into the heart of the song. And yet I'm not going to get sent off to Australia, to a penal colony, but I can identify with having done something wrong in my life and what my family or community might feel about that. This is a lived history and people love that as a sort of authentic voice. It's not just an item in a museum behind closed doors that is untouchable. It still really touches people. People sing these because they like them and they listen because they like them. The song Whitby Lad that we're hearing Faye sing is actually a version of a very widely known song, often called Botany Bay. Faye's rendition is a very special version that's taken that classic song and been naturalised and kept alive by some of the old singers in this part of Yorkshire. I first heard the song sung by Mike Waterson, who's an amazing singer from a family of amazing singers, the Watersons. And I met him towards the end of his life. He passed away a few years ago now, and he was living at Robin Hood's Bay, just down the road from Whitby. So he has a real connection to the place. When I hear this song, I hear him singing it, and I think of visiting him there. I was born and bred in Whitby town and raised most honestly Till I became a roving blade which proved me destiny Songs work on a couple of different levels. You've got the narrative content of the lyrics and the story that the song is talking about. We've got this guy from Whitby talking about the penal colonies. So we can understand what's going on in the world at that time through the lyrics of the song. But we've also got the story of the journey of the song to reach me. So this song was collected from a man called Mr. Verrill from Staithes, just north of Whitby, by R.A. Gatty, a collector who collected a lot around Yorkshire. And presumably, Mike Waterson got interested in it because it was from the area that he was from. And then here we are singing it on an English heritage education project, trying to help people get a relationship with places in England. So the meaning of the song is shifted and shaped each time it's performed in a new context to mean something quite different. Even though it's the same words and music, it, it moulds itself into the society that it finds itself a part of. Oh, there is a lass in Whitby town and the girl that I love full well And it's if I had me liberty along with her I'd dwell Well, it's boys, oh boys, there are no joys down there in Botany Bay the Whitby Lad is from the 18th century when British convicts were being shipped off to penal colonies in Australia. It gives us an insight into the desperate lives of that time. Abel Sulachow is performing another song detailing the appalling conditions of labourers and the effects of poverty. The Fallen Weaver is about a man who loses his work as a cotton weaver to the machines of industrialisation. Abel sings it here in relation to Iron Bridge, the heart place of the Industrial Revolution. I'm a fallen weaver, as a many a man knows. I've now to eat, and I've worn out my clothes. So this song is a folk song that is dedicated to people who work with their hands and specifically weaving cotton. It was the time when technology was coming close to overtaking uh, human efforts and people finding that they were being put out of work because the steam machine could churn out so much more. So they find themselves having to work extra hard to be able to take care of their home. So the song begins with an introduction 
And this introduction is in the language of Sesotho. This is my home language. Uh, and it speaks of all the things uh, that will happen throughout the piece. So uh, it talks about working so hard that uh, you, you can't anymore and uh, competing against machines and that replacing our sustenance and how important it is that we stand up for our community and speak for ourselves in order to be able to provide for our families with our hands. So I, I went back into my sort of archive in my brain and, and looked for a character that has lived, you know, almost a similar life. So my mother is one. So she used to make hats in a factory and she would get paid by, by how many hats she would make. I take that character and I, I write a narrative on the side in my own language, expressing that journey, you know, of pressure and that journey of, of doing so much for so little. So I try to, to interpret that with either the voice and the throat singing uh, to kind of make it coarse and rough and that feeling, you know, explaining the clogs are broken and things like that. So we have kind of two narratives that go along the whole song. And water, porridge, to us food. The crux of folk music is passing on these tunes along generations, you know. It's been passed down in order to advise how we live today. We live in, in, in a place that's wonderfully mixed and, and full of so many different people. But yet again, the tradition of folk music is still going because these tunes are being passed on to different people. And, and now they're just being passed on to, to different hands. In so many ways, history has repeated itself time and time and again. You know, the, the balance of power that is steeped the other way is something that's constantly been there through the ages. There are people who live in, in squalor next to the richest of places. In South Africa, you know, you'll have a mansion right next to some squatter camp. So the storyline of, of, of the four-volume waiver is one, I think, that goes around, you know, and relates to, to many different communities besides, you know, the English community. These songs are still there to keep trying to, to teach us to change the course or to still have the power to speak out. Abel has brought his own style and narratives to these songs of England. For me, that is what this project, connecting folk song with our great historical monuments, is about. People's stories. Matt Thompson from English Heritage has been at the heart of this project to bring Songs of England to some of our great historical sites. Ironbridge is the perfect setting to explain why song can connect us to these places of history. Now on the face of it, you might ask the question, why pair the song Four Loom Weavers with this incredible monument? After all, the song itself is about uh, textile uh, manufacture in the, in the 19th century, and this, of course, is a much, much earlier item. It's very much about the production of iron. But really what we're looking at is this idea of being human at a time of momentous change. What Abel's done is, is fantastic and really is, a, is, is sort of an inspiration to us all in one sense. He's taken an historic monument and he's taken a pre-existing song and he's married that with his, his own family's experiences of working with their hands to make ends meet. I think this is one of the sort of never-ending kind of treasures really with the landscape around us and with the past is that we can look to that and whilst a history book might tell us what something is all about, we can feel something about a place. That's just as valid. It's fantastic to be able to make new narratives, new stories by bringing together lots of different elements of one. Telling the stories of the people who are woven into these historical landscapes, and not just kings and queens, but weavers, soldiers, farmers and even criminals, these are the stories we find in the oral tradition, but are also still affecting and happening to us today, which is why it's so important that we keep telling these stories and re-singing these songs for future generations. And 